This is Jeff Mucci with RCR Wireless News, and we are here with Ian Gillett with IGR. Uh, Ian, thanks for joining us today. No problem. Good to see you. Well, you had your annual DAS forecast press release last week, and I couldn't resist but to give you a call and, and talk a little bit more about it. $19 billion in the U.S. Uh, yeah. Tell us a bit about the study, how it was prepared, and, uh, and then we'll go into some more detail about DAS. No, I think it's, I think this is the third or fourth year we've done this now. Um, and uh, basically, simply, we went out there and look at how much DAS is out there. Um, one of the big challenges we have every year is how many DAS systems there are, physical systems uh, installed and nodes and those types of things, as well as how many carriers are on those systems. So if you go to all the carriers and say, how many DAS do you support? You get a huge number because, of course, multiple carriers are on the same DAS system. They plug into the same DAS. So we do, the report does break that out. Uh, this year, we also looked at MDUs. Um, and uh, we do look at um, you know, how, the, uh, how the carrier is also connecting in, look at the cost of deployment and how much is being spent. And hence the, the 19 billion you mentioned. So does, uh, what constitutes DAS in your study? Does it include ODAS or is it simply IDAS? Uh, it's both. Um, so it is literally DAS. <laughs> okay. Uh, and this is one question we always get is where does it fit, fit compared to a small cell? Uh, to us, in our hierarchy, DAS is a small cell. So just as a femto cell, pico cell, metro cell, etc., cetera, uh, remote radio head is as well. So DAS is one of those variants, and we do break out the other ones as well in different reports. Um, what's changed this year as well, as well is in previously, uh, this has changed over the last couple of years, but now we're seeing a lot more um, deployments where you take actually a small cell radio and plug it straight into a 2 watt or 5 watt unit, plug it straight into the DAS array so you don't need the attenuation board and all the, the things that you need when you don't take a 40 watt macro cell and try to power it down. And that's, that saves money. That makes it a lot cheaper to deploy. So. Well, you mentioned small cell, but your report also mentions uh, digital radio systems, DRS. Yeah. So expand a little bit on what a DRS system is and how it compares to DAS and small cell. Yeah, so we, we actually we look at that as, as, as a form of DAS. Um, it is you know, a distributed uh, radio system instead of antenna system. Um, and uh, it, it really, um, basically what you're doing is put little radios out on the end of the fiber and controlling them digitally. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you can be a little smarter about it in terms of where that capacity goes. You can deal with interference and things like this a little, a little better. So we really look at that as a form of DAS. It is still distributed. So you've distributed the radio throughout a building, just as you do with a DAS. And actually, this is one of the things we've been, we've, we've been talking about publicly, and I've mentioned it in conferences, is DAS is one of those technologies. It really needs a new acronym. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the distributed antenna system sounds a little 2G, 3G, you know. We need to get a little more digital in there, a little more radio distributed. Maybe it should be digital distributed, you know, broadcast system. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, you know, this year, my, or 2016, appears to be a year more small cell deployments. So I'm kind of curious how the, the small cell deployments and densification efforts uh, are, are impacted the DAS specific forecast. Yeah, so it's, it, you're right. It, it is interesting. And there's two things really we've seen happen. The first is that it's obviously it's very difficult to get a lot of small cell outdoor deployments, not because of the technology, but because of the zoning and the permitting and the right of way and all these things. Um, as that happened, a lot of those vendors and that opportunities kind of run inside and said, well, you know, we can cover the buildings. And then with buildings, all you're going to deal with is a property manager, a property owner, and the carrier. So you're not dealing with right of way and cities and municipalities and things like this. So, so we have seen a lot more interest in small cell in, indoors. Um, DAS has, of course, always been indoors as well as in arenas and things like this. Um, what we've seen the forecast now is the arenas are pretty much done. The, I mean, there's not many football stadiums out there that don't have DAS in some form or another. Same for the uh, convention centers. 
So now, as I mentioned earlier, getting the cost structure down on those DAS systems with things like DRS and using the small cell architecture, then DAS can start to address smaller sized buildings. And so what you end up is almost like a, a top down and bottom up if the femto cells are dealing with the home and the small, build, the small business, the DAS is dealt with the big buildings, the kind of meeting in the middle, if you like. And that's what we kind of see happening. Um, I'm not going to tell you that DAS can supply, do every size of building. It doesn't, it's not economic at small buildings. And likewise, putting you know, 100 femto cells into a large building doesn't make any sense either. So, but you know, it, it's kind of matching the technology to the uh, opportunity here is what's really happening. So you mentioned technology changes are driving down the cost curve. Can you be a little more specific in terms of uh, how technology is changing that ecosystem cost structure? Well, so two things. One is like that DRS you mentioned. If I can be smarter about where the radio signal actually goes in the building and control it uh, at the node, I can be much more efficient in how I plan that and deploy that building. Okay. And then the second thing is I mentioned that you, know, you plug a small cell into the antenna array, you don't need that attenuation board. Those attenuation boards are $10,000. Um, and of course, a macro cell is, you know, can be tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. So instead, we're plugging in a three, five thousand dollar unit into something that used to cost fifty thousand dollars. Immediately, you've got a cost savings. Got it. And obviously, it's needed. Well, earlier this year, we visited uh, Verizon in New York City, and they they were in the process of building out these base station hotels that, in their mind, was good, were going to serve indoor DAS, small cell radios, etc. Uh, how much of an impact is a using a base station hotel to serve an in-building DAS versus building a head in, in in a building? What kind of impact will that have on the cost structure? Um, a, a little. It depends. I mean, actually, the building, if we've got a large building and you're putting the, uh, the radio for the DAS in the basement, you may want to choose to put your data center down there to feed the rest of the remote radio heads outside of that building. It may be the center. So on the DAS, doesn't have any difference on that. Likewise, it could be the building over. And it, it's a tough and question to answer because it really depends on what the connect connectivity is available into that building. If we're going to put that head end somewhere else, we've got to have really good fiber going into that from one building to another. So if, if it's not there, it makes no economic sense to install the fiber. I'll tell you, <laughs> we're not digging up streets for this. So there's no reason that actually the building with DAS could not be the, the focal point of your, uh, that solution you're talking about where we push remote radio heads outside. Well, as you move away from the stadiums and hospitality and convention centers down to the uh, MDUs and the uh, commercial buildings, uh, who, who, who's in a better position, the carriers with the building owners or the new, traditional neutral host providers? Yeah. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> well, it, it's, the answer is yes. And actually what we've seen is it really depends on the building owner. And I actually, I was talking to one of the big vendors uh, who's moving into a new um, headquarters building. And the whole thing is wireless. And I said to them, so who built the DAS and the architecture for the building? Was it you or was it the building owner? I mean, you're the tenant, they're the building owner. Who's driving who? Did they offer it to you or did you demand it? And um, it seems to be that some building owners are kind of thinking ahead of the curve and starting to get involved in this. Others are finding that tenants are coming to them saying, hey, I'm sorry, but if I'm going to take that floor or that building, I need this, this, and this. And it is power, AC, parking, and wireless service. Um, in others, the carriers are forcing, so it depends on the relationships that they've got. They've got a lot of building relationships already. I mean, if you think of the Lex, who are also wireless carriers, they've got all these relationships already in some cases. So it really depends on who you're talking about and where, but it seems that, and then there's the third parties going, hang on, we see an opportunity here. I'm going to go get some relationships with property owners. I'm going to bring the carrier and a DAS vendor to them and I'm going to be the, the systems integrator, if you like. And we're seeing all of that right now. And I think it's a little too early to say which model is going to win. Right now, we want those models executed. We want the systems being built. 
Well, it seems to me over the past four to five years that the uh, building asset managers, whether it be a commercial building or an MDU, the asset managers really didn't connect the dots in terms of vacancy rates caused by lack of coverage translates to millions and billions of dollars worth of overall value in their portfolio. Are you starting to see a change? Yeah, there's a when certainly at the high end. I'm not sure we're down at the level where there's a, a building manager who's got four or five buildings, let's say. But certainly the people uh, you know who own millions of square feet. Um, um, that absolutely, there's yeah. Okay, this is the next big thing we're going to have to differentiate on, uh, just like power, you know, AC, etc. Um, so it'll it'll definitely get there. I think it will be a trickle down. Yeah. But, but um, you're right, the asset managers. I mean, if, if if you think about it, they've already they're already in that direction anyway. There's a number of companies that now have bring your own device. Well, you can't have bring your own device be effective if there's no coverage in the building. Yeah. <laughs> so the asset manager at the company has to say, bring your own device because we have got wireless. I've made sure of that. I've done my job. Um, bit of a problem if there's no coverage there. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, close on, on CIPRI. I've, got, I've talked to some OEMs who say CIPRI is the future, and I've talked to other OEM, OEMs who don't have a CIPRI product who say CIPRI is going to get passed by. So I'm, I'm, you're the expert on, on DAS, and so I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on CIPRI. Yeah, CIPRI is going to evolve. Um, and uh, today's CIPRI is there is a new version. I think it's version 6. Um, and there's another acronym for it, which, of course, I know you're going to ask me now. I can't remember. Um, but uh, basically, uh, CIPRI today, there is a radio and then there's the baseband, and CIPRI runs between the two. What we're looking at doing is taking that baseband and splitting that functionality. So some of that baseband functionality goes on the radio, so we've got a little bit more, fun, uh, more flexibility in architecture out there. And other parts of that baseband get pulled back into a data center. And then the, let's call it CIPRI 6 actually manages between the two. The problem with CIPRI today is the overhead on it is big. It takes a chunk of fi um, bandwidth to run it effectively. And it's okay when you're running a few radio heads, but when we're talking about 100,000 or so, it gets really, and, and you know, and remember today, we do have remote radio head, but the radio is on the tower and there's a couple of hundred feet of fiber down to Cypri at the bottom of the baseband. That's fine. What we're talking about now is moving that 15 miles. Yeah. Right? That's when the issue comes up. So is Cypri dead? Current version probably isn't going to do what we need it to do. It won't scale. Does the core technology evolve into a new version, just as 3G, you know, 2G became 3G, 3G became 4G LTE, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's what uh, Tom, and you're right, vendors do, um, uh, some vendors say, no, no, Cypri's dead because we've got X. Some others are saying, no, Cypri's great because we do Cypri, uh, and they're all actually talking about evolving it to uh, Cypri service. So what's your big prediction? I know 19 billion is a big number, but what are some of the other big predictions Ian Gilt has for 2016? Um, I, I think, uh, oh gosh. So yes, more small cells. Uh, I think you've just got to be very flexible in how you define small cell. <laughs> um, it really is a lot more difficult than the industry expected um to put these things out there because of non-technical issues it really is availability of backhaul availability of right of way etc so i think you're going to see a lot of remote radio here my fear is with 16 is that as we talk more and more and more of 5g that the carriers are now we're already seeing this they're, they're kind of reluctant to invest in anything that doesn't have a roadmap into 5g 5g is close enough now you know 2018 19 here will be starting to really get serious about it. I don't want to put anything in 2016 that doesn't have a roadmap to that. So I've got to be very careful. If I'd done that in 2013 or 14, you know, I could have had a three, four, five year lifespan of that equipment. That's okay. Now I don't have that. So we're kind of squeezing the, the, the uh, time frames here. I think that's the first thing. The second thing is we're going to be talking about bandwidth constraints a whole lot more in 16. We know it's bad today. Video is all over the place. You've got at t with DirecTV. You've got T-Mobile with their, um, uh, not counting your gigabytes 
in the video right. budget plan, whatever it's called. And you've got Verizon with Go90. And um, all of them are the infancy right now of what we're seeing. But some of the numbers out of T-Mobile make me believe that this is going to be huge. And when I look at my kids who, you know, you and I are too old, we're not the future, right? My kids are what's killing the network. Uh, to them, if it's not, if Wi-Fi is too slow, um, you know, my son's in college, it's too slow, he just turns it off and use LTE. <laughs> and uh, he'll run that, uh, he, he can use 20 gigs in a month without, with watching TV. Um, and, you know, complete aside here, I, I called my cable operator today to get my bill down. I'm actually removing the set-top boxes from my house tomorrow, and we are going to apps over our smart TV. It's going to save me $20 a month. There you go. The cable operator told me to do that, and they pushed me and said, use the wireless network. Use LTE. Watch it while you're out of your house. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cable, guys. So I think next year we're going to be talking about bandwidth, uh, signaling constraints, capacity issues, um, and everybody's going to be scrambling from that discussion. It's going to move into the small cells, remote radio head, spectrum, who has what, who can get deployed what, who can deal with who to get spectrum they may own. All of that stuff is going to be a big discussion. But the end result of it all is 5G is looming, and I'm not going to do anything that doesn't give me a roadmap. Well, on our next discussion, we're going to put you on the spot and ask you to tell us what 5G is, but I, I'm not going to do that today unless you want to volunteer. Uh, you know, actually, it's, we've just done a report, uh, uh, and I, IMT 2020, as far as I'm concerned, that is 5G, and that is 2020. That is the technical standard. Uh, I, am, I never underestimate the uh, ability of the wireless industry to shoot itself in the foot, and um, uh, you will see carriers in 2017 and 18 launching 5G services based on LTE release 12, release 13, and they will call it 5G. So as an industry, I said 5G, I already talked about it here. I'm really trying to get people, I, I, you know, can we stop talking about 5G? Can we talk about IMT 2020? And I, I think it'd be a brave operator actually who says, we are not gonna go for 5G, we're gonna do something, you know, super fast wireless service. You know, I just skip straight, skip straight to 10G. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny because when we wrote the report internally, um, the joke was that by the time the industry deploys IMT 2020 5G, it will be branded 7G. <laughs> <laughs> Facetiousness aside, probably not that far apart from that. Probably true. <laughs> Well, listen, Ian, thanks for your time today. I, I enjoy your holiday, and I'm sure you will, we'll see the trade show soon. You too. See you in the new year. Thanks.